afternoon to our colleagues in South Africa and other parts of the world. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankashaw, Weya, Miami, Maskutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. I'm Ritu Mabukela, Vice Provost for International Affairs and Global Strategies here at the University of Illinois. Thank you for joining us today for a great conversation, higher education leadership in a complex global 21st century. We will have a 60 minute conversation with Vice Chancellor and Principal Dawana Pupe of the University of Pretoria and Vice Chancellor Chiliti Marala of the University of Johannesburg. They will discuss the changing landscape for higher education as it is impacted by major global trends, including demographic changes, aging populations, political shifts, and national education policies. These global trends coupled with national concerns regarding education access, affordability, changing student and faculty profiles, and challenges university leaders will face to collaborate and explore innovative solutions that transcend geopolitical boundaries, which seek to address UN sustainable goals, particularly those related to widening access, reducing inequality, improving gender equality, and pursuing peace and social justice. We are also very fortunate to have Chancellor Robert Jones here with us as the moderator of today's conversation. Chancellor Jones is the 10th Chancellor of the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. And we want to thank you for making time in your schedule to be with us today. And with that, Chancellor Jones, I turn it over to you. Well, let me start by saying thank you, Raytu, and good morning to all of you that are watching today. Uh, this great conversation has been months in the making, and although I think we all certainly wish that we could gather together in person on stage at some venue here uh, in uh, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, or in one of your institutions in South Africa, I can say I'm certainly glad that we are now able to have this chance to, to meet virtually and to begin our conversation uh, that is really very, very significant, not only to our respected university, but I think to higher education in, in general. Uh, so let us begin by, first of all, welcoming our two uh, vice chancellors and principals uh, to this great conversation. Uh, we've had a chance to, uh, one of us to meet a couple of times over the last uh, few years. Uh, and the other person we've met virtually, but I can't tell you how pleased and how proud I am to be able to embark on this conversation with you today about important issues uh, affecting higher education. And so kind of to get us started, and I know we uh, all have been preoccupied for the last 12, 14 months with all things COVID. But uh, if you could just briefly start by giving us just a bit of context of how you've uh, been able to navigate this crisis uh, in the last 12 months, what are been some of your greatest challenges and some of the greatest opportunity? And then we'll focus the rest of the conversations on things not related to COVID, but I just wanted us to maybe acknowledge that that's an ongoing crisis that all institutions have had to face. And we would uh, love to, for you to share your perspective uh, uh, with, with our, our participants. Uh, 
So I'm going to start with uh, 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 Vice uh, Chancellor Marwala. Could you start? And then uh, Vice Chancellor Kope will ask you to uh, state your perspective as well. Welcome. Great to have you with us today. No, no, no. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jones. Uh, uh, of course, uh, I've known Professor Jones. I first met him in 1990. That is exactly 31 years ago. Yes, uh, uh, COVID has been a big challenge for us. Uh, the University of Johannesburg is, uh, uh, is, is, is a large university with over 50,000 students. The first big challenge was, what do you do when there is a, a national lockdown? Uh, we had to send all our students back home. Uh, so we emptied the, the campus. Of course, we had to deal with international students uh, and students who were not in a position to go to their homes. So we had to make arrangements on campus. Of course, strict guidelines were observed during the time. Then when the students were home, uh, the academic program had to continue. Uh, in fact, uh, the University of Johannesburg was the first university in South Africa to complete the academic year. Uh, we managed to complete it on time uh, last year. So we had to make sure that they have devices uh, to be able to connect to their classes. We had to make sure that um, uh, um, they, have, um, they have data uh, so that they can be able to uh, connect. Of course, there are other challenges uh, because uh, not all areas of South Africa are uni uniformly, um, uh, 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 you know, have access to, um, to broadband uh, uh, telecommunication uh, services. And then, of course, there was the issue of, of teaching uh, and learning, uh, a mindset shift uh, for many of our students. Traditionally, we, we always did blended learning. And, and, and moving completely online was just a half a step and, 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 and that worked out quite well. But many of our academic staff were telling us that uh, the workload uh, is quite high. Of course, there are bigger challenges of uh, students who require clinical platforms in order to study, who require labs in order to study, uh, which we had to make uh, arrangements uh, for, 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 for those uh, students. Where it was quite difficult is how do you get uh, academic staff and, and postgraduate students who require uh, to do research on campus uh, using labs? You know? uh, that obviously had to slow down. Uh, many of them remained on campus, but uh, access to their labs was, was severely limited. And, uh, and of course it had an impact on, on us. So, uh, so uh, now we are back on campus, and, uh, but we don't have any physical classes. Uh, we're still working uh, remotely and we, we, we observe strict guidelines. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that. It seems that uh, we have uh, had some of the same approaches that you've had to confront as well. So uh, Vice Chancellor Kupe, would you please respond to that question. Thank you, Chancellor Johnson, for this uh, opportunity to share our experiences. Well, we had some somewhat similar uh, um, challenges as uh, our colleagues at the University of Johannesburg. But we, 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 where we had uh, some advantage, uh, which helped us very much, was that since 1998, the University of Pretoria has been uh, experimenting with educational technologies of various kinds and also adapting fairly rapidly to digital technologies. So also fortunately in 2019, when I joined the university, we put in about 10 million, uh, put 10 million US dollar upgrade to our IT equipment. And that really came in handy in 2020 when COVID hit because it meant our students didn't need data all the time, no our staff. They only needed data at particular points when they were doing assessments, quizzes, and so on, we could create a global platform, which if you enter the learning and management system, you could. We're also lucky that we have a very innovative and creative Department of Education Innovation, which is not an IT division, but is actually a teaching and learning division driven by notions of creativity in teaching and learning 
and also using hybrid teaching and learning. So typically at the University of Pretoria, students would go online before class, could, would use online resources, and so would the faculty or the professors in, in, during a class, and post-class they have to consolidate online. So our only challenge now was that we're now completely 100% online, but both faculty and students were highly competent. And this is not just my say-so or our say-so. We also ran large, very specific surveys. If we had time, I would actually show up on the slides here. The kinds of results we got from very, very concise tracking of what people were doing online, when, during what lesson, with what degrees of interactivity and degree, degrees of discomfort. We've run another survey this year, and we're very pleased about the various competencies. But of course, the one thing that drove our, our particular philosophy was one stu no student left behind. That meant, and also the second principle was complete the academic year in 2020. So we actually delayed our start of online learning by two weeks deliberately mm -hmm. in order to fulfill the no student left behind principle. This meant then we mobilized resources from philanthropies within the university, including a solidarity fund to which we all donated and got the laptops to be delivered to each student. But still, as, as, as my colleague said, Prof. Marwana, there are areas where even if I gave a student a laptop, they wouldn't be able to use it. And so right. that was a challenge. And some students, the indigent students and international students were also kept behind. So what we did with the students who, we, who, we couldn't, who couldn't use any laptop even if they wanted to, we actually organized a system of telephone tutoring plus hard copy materials. So we, hire, we had to hire new faculty to actually support those students. And there were about a hundred or so spread around the country. And though, because the principle of no student left behind meant we couldn't simply say, you are a victim of the digital divide, you are on your own, you are left behind. And this I think has paid dividends because what we didn't want to do is in a sense to go against the spirit of our transformation policy, which says there must be diversity and inclusion and diversity as inclusion must operate at all levels. And so I think that uh, we learned a lot of things. Uh, we, we understood, we learned a, num a number of things. One, our online operation is actually very strong. It will lead to more online offerings going forward. But second, we really believe in a hybrid approach, not a hundred percent, but it must be nuanced. You can't say it's, it's going to be online for everybody or hybrid for everybody. We are now in that very, that very exciting space of saying, what should be online, when, for, who, and how, and also how that's going to shake up the whole way in which we offer our programs. There is more, but I think I should stop there for now. No, I, I really appreciate you both addressing this issue because uh, what uh, jumps out at, to me, and I'm sure others very clearly, that uh, notwithstanding where you might be in this country, in the US or in South Africa, we've all had to think out of the box uh, and to innovate quite quickly to continue to be able to provide uh, quality educational experiences uh, to our students. And uh, maybe slight differences in terms of how uh, we specifically approached it, but the clear message is that uh, your institutions, my institution, many other across the world have been able to navigate this pandemic in, in the ways that keeps our students safe or provide to quality educational experience. So I pr appreciate your comments in that regard. Um, let me just say that uh, uh, I think some people participating may be aware that, you know, I spent a significant amount of my time in South Africa. And as Vice Chancellor Mawala said, I met him probably about 1990, uh, doing my more than a decade of uh, working in South Africa. So I little know, probably a little bit about the, the pre-apartheid uh, uh, South Africa, but uh, post-apartheid is a very interesting uh, uh, lesson and examples as well. But let me just say that universities, I think you all would agree, are embedded in complex societies that in many ways do truly reflect the social and cultural and the economic complexities of that society within which they are located. So university leaders, I think you both would agree, um, university leaders must be able to lead within these complex environments. 
And you have one of the most complex environments that uh, I'm aware of. And, and I can tell you here in America, it's becoming more complex and interesting as well. So could you identify for us some of the key leadership challenges beyond COVID? We will part COVID for now. Uh, with which you have been confronted in your role as a university leader in this post-apartheid uh, South Africa, or in generally as it relates to the African content, uh, continent, and um, in a world that's increasingly globalized in a world where higher education is uh, a very much a part of that globalized arena in which we live and work and educate. Let me start with uh, with uh, with Kope for this one, and we'll kind of go back and forth that way. Okay, yeah. So I think it's a very interesting question and not easy to answer. So let me put it this way, given the historical background that you actually sketched out, which to be a little more precise was that South Africa for a long time until 1994 was partly from the ostracization of the apartheid regime, the sanctions disconnected from the world. So it was a, the institutions in the country were very much inward looking and not that well connected to the African continent and global. So, but some of those institutions were actually good and gave a very high quality education. That includes my institution, the University of Pretoria. So on taking the reins uh, as vice chancellor, I could still see large markers of that insularity. So though the university offers one of the best facilities you can ever find on the, on the African continent, there was still a degree of insularity among the larger number of the faculty, but not everybody, of course. The top guys in my institution are as globally connected as anyone could be. So our reflection at the Investor Pretoria in my particular approach is that what Investor Pretoria needs to, be, to do is as a South African institution that is anchored in, in, in its context, it needs to adopt the posture of being an African global university. In other words, seeing itself as South African primarily because this is our home, but, but also actually an African institution. And I'll, I'll say a little more about what I mean by that, but also globally connected. And globally, I do not mean just to North America and to, the, to, 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 the, to, to Europe, because that also is part of the, the history or the legacies, if you like, where these institutions could get connections. It was largely North America and, 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 the, and, and Europe. So what we have created a framework which is actually working very well for us. And strangely, during COVID, we made huge advances in that framework, the African Global University Framework. So it goes, it goes like this. We, will, we are choosing 35 to 45 institutions who will be our strategic partners. In other words, the relationship exists at my level. And you, uh, Chancellor Jones, we are in a discussion around the same notion, and we're meeting in a, in a couple of weeks' time to do that. So some of those institutions will be African on the African continent. Some will be across the world. So in Japan, for example, we've struck a relationship with the University of Tokyo. In the US, we're talking to you, but we have a strategic relationship with NYU, with Harvard, in, on, in, 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 uh, Harvard Business School and other divisions, Princeton, Michigan State University, among others. But it doesn't stop at at, at just institution to institution. We also join networks which can expand our geographic spread. So for example, with Michigan, we are part of what is called the African Alliance Partnership. It's 10 African universities plus Michigan State University. And then we, we forge relationships in that. We are part of the African Research Universities Association, 17 African universities. I'm the co-president of the Australia Africa Uni University Network 15 Australian universities, 15 African universities. And so it goes. So through, through both partnerships and networks, because I personally believe knowledge knows no borders and boundaries. That knowledge is the most global of things that you can do. That is best co-created global. And in those frameworks and in those partnerships, we embed four or five things. Joint research projects, including joint fundraising, staff, student, and faculty exchange staff and student training. So we actually, for example, with Madoc University in the Australia, I met them before COVID, but we have had a lot of virtual engagements, including seminars we hold with them. We're going to, to offer joint doctoral degrees between Madoc University in Australia and, 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 
and University of Pretoria. So we also want to actually be innovative and creative in creating new programs that can be delivered both in hybrid mode and contact mode when travel allows, but also in virtual mode. And also we also want to experiment the new virtual way, the, the, way, the new world in which you can deliver things virtually and digitally. But we don't stop there. We believe in interdisciplinarity or transdisciplinarity. So we're looking for partners that have that particular approach. Why? We believe that over the last so many decades, universities and societies have grown apart. In that space has entered people who doubt knowledge and who despise knowledge. Trump was a great example, but he's not the only one. People don't believe in facts, who believe in fake news, and who do not believe in the power of knowledge. And who do not believe in the transformative nature of knowledge. So we believe also universities should not just chase rankings and metrics for measuring research. That is important. Research must be high quality, but it must translate into impact, into changing lives and transforming societies, finding vaccines for pandemics and other social and economic pandemics. So, so that, that, if you like, is the challenge that we... So, so, so over the last 80, 24, 25 months, investor of PTO has become very African-connected, and is getting more globally connected using those uh, 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 navigational markers. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. Vice Chancellor Maral. No, no, th thank you very much. Uh, obviously, uh, 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 we live in a new dispensation uh, and uh, uh, my institution, uh, University of, uh, of, of Johannesburg, uh, uh, its predecessor, uh, we changed the name, which used to be the Rand Afrikaans University was actually an apartheid uh, project uh, in Johannesburg. It was formed by uh, the ruling class called the, the Grudebond, uh, you know. Uh, so, so, so the first thing that we, all, we, we had to, to deal with is to change the mindset. How do you change an institution that was uh, directed at creating the infrastructure of, of, of oppression to creating a university that is directed at creating the infrastructure for development, for liberating the minds and so on and so forth. Very, very important. Now, there are many, many things that uh, uh, we had to do uh, on, on teaching and learning. Uh, we, 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 we obviously, our education must, must actually be directed at the so solving positively the problems that are actually confronting our, our, our society. So one of the things that we have done as the University of Johannesburg, in order to, to open that avenue of teaching and learning, one of the things that we wanted our students to have is to understand the African continent. So we introduced what we call uh, Africa by bus and innovation by bus in Africa. So we take um, at a given time, we will take uh, um, 40 buses uh, to, we have taken them to Namibia, we have taken them to Botswana, we have taken them to Zimbabwe, we have taken them to uh, Mozambique, we have taken them to Zambia. And uh, this uh, last year, um, we were planning to go to, uh, to Kampala via Kigali and by bus, because we understand that it's not quite the same thing when you are actually flying. You know, by bus, it means you have to stop by the roadside. It means you have to see the problems of Africa uh, so that you can be able to craft. The intention is for them to understand the problems of Africa, but also to craft solutions for this Af uh, problem so that you can be able to confront that. And then the second thing that we have done is, uh, is that all our students have to take what we call the Africa Insight Modules. So they have to understand African politics. They have to understand all of them, whether they are studying engineering, they have to understand the African economy. They have to understand the problems of uh, connectivity in Africa. Um, very, whether it is physical connectivity, flying from one part of the, the, the continent to another is, is quite difficult. Sometimes you have to leave the continent in order to fly from one part of the world. So, so that was the mindset that we had to do. Then the second thing, was to change the direction of the research agenda. Because the research agenda, certainly of my university, was directed at strengthening the military industrial complex. 
And of course, uh, South Africa was quite aggressive uh, in the 80s uh, uh, during apartheid. Uh, it fought the border war in Angola. It was involved in, in the civil war in, in Mozambique. Uh, uh, it was involved in, in obviously, it was uh, uh, running uh, Namibia and so on and so forth. Now, how do we, and so we have to direct our, our research agenda so that we can solve big global problems, uh, problems of migration, which are big problems uh, and here in our continent and in, just here on our campus. We see it given the fact that uh, out of 50,000 students, 8,000 of them come from the rest of the African continent. So all those uh, 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 problems, uh, xenophobia, how to deal with the uh, multicultural environment and so on and so forth becomes actually uh, real. Uh, problems of, of, of climate change, which is which uh, we know that Africa is going to be impacted the most. Uh, and we already can see, you know, uh, our region is becoming uh, uh, more of a desert uh, than any other part uh, uh, of, of, of the continent. You know, what are the solutions for that? The problems of energy, because we expanded uh, provision to electricity. We moved from, uh, uh, in 1990, uh, where only 10% uh, 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 of our population had access to electricity to almost 80%. But with, 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 with bigger demand, you need bigger uh, capacity. And of course, we have, we, 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 we did not plan that very, very well. How about diversifying the energy mix, for example? How about solar energy? And one of the things that we have done at the University of Johannesburg, over the last uh, 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 two years, we have moved from 100% dependency on, uh, on fossil fuel to 85%, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, so 15% of our energy now needs yeah, actually comes from, 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 from solar. And then obviously uh, uh, the University of Johannesburg uh, became stakeholder orientated. Who are our stakeholders? Of course, we have to work with governments, not just government, because uh, on our campus, we have more than, we have people from more than 80 different nationalities. We have to work with governments. We have to work with industry. And it is obviously quite, uh, quite advantageous that uh, uh, Johannesburg is the most industrialized part of, uh, of, 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 of our country. We have to work with, uh, with, with, with the financial sectors, but most importantly, we have to work with the society. For example, we have uh, two campuses now in Soweto because we believe that we have to take education to our community. And of course, we had to internationalize uh, joint degrees uh, uh, with uh, universities uh, from all the continents, whether it is in the United States, whether it is in China. We host uh, students, for example, we, we do uh, summer courses for the law students from uh, 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 Cornell University. Uh, they come here for, 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 for two months. Uh, so, so, so those are some of the things that we are doing uh, post-apartheid. Well, let me say, I, I really appreciate the, the uh, breadth and the thoroughness of your answers, be in particular providing that historical context in which your universities exist. We're talking about two entities that have uh, different histories, and but yet the issues and how you address globalization, how do you position your university post-apartheid to deal with globalization is a critically important issue. And I, I appreciate your answer. So let's continue on here uh, with the next question. I, I think you also would agree that our respective universities are, are very much anchored in two countries uh, with challenging legacies around issues of social justice, uh, equality, and uh, uh, certainly the apartheid system in South Africa is something, as I said, that I got deeply engaged in way back in 1974, 84, and spent 10 years working to move the, the country and its educational system past that. Um, but also, as you well know, in the same context, we are still recovering in many ways from Jim Crow here in the United States and 
you've also seen play out in this country a real uh, greater attention and focus on racism and injustice. So uh, we've had to come to uh, face to face with this challenging issue. And I, so my next question is what role can our universities play to address these uh, social political issues uh, which continue to manifest themselves in ways, uh, in various ways in the, in the current context? Uh, you know, uh, this is the question of our time. It's the question that mm -hmm. all of our universities, whether you're in South Africa or Nigeria or the U.S. of A, you're having to come to grips with this issue. So, so what is the role of our universities to be part of the solution? And do we run the risk if we're not part of the solution? Do we become part of the problem? I think is a candid way of framing. So, uh, Kofi. Yeah, so well, I think to be quite direct, our universities have to be anti-discrimination, both in content of the knowledge we teach and in posture and action. In other words, I'm suggesting that our universities become advocacy organizations and activist organizations on all of the social justice issues uh, that are legacies of the past and also some which have emerged in the present, if you like. So I mean, in South Africa, obviously, there is a legacy of racism. There is also gender inequality and worse, in South Africa, femicide. The gender-based violence and femicide are endemic. It's another pandemic that we actually have. Then, of course, as you know, South Africa is one of the most unequal societies in the world. And there's growing poverty and unemployment exacerbated by COVID, but also it was it, it, it pre predates COVID, if you like. I mean, on the eve of COVID, for 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 what for for what it matters as a measure, all of the major uh, economic ranking agencies downgraded us to junk status in relation to our economy. It's one of the strongest economies still in South Af in Africa, still an engine of economic growth in Africa. But if you like, the fruits of democracy have not been distributed equally. So that is a potent mix for social injustice and also could cause us problems going forward. So our universities therefore should actually take a position, of course, as academic institutions, that means the research we do. Just as you can see behind me, the Future Africa Institute. It's an institute that is both looks at all of these issues, not just in South Africa, but across the continent and takes an interdisciplinary approach. Because if we're really going to be activists change makers and change drivers in our societies, in South Africa and the continent. We can't do it alone. So our partnerships with civil society organizations, partnerships with government and philanthropists and so on, we have that agenda becomes important. So at Investor Pretoria, I'll give you at least three examples which we are trying to do this since a, a, the dawn of democracy. First, we have a Center for Human Rights that was created before democracy. Center for Human Rights actually is, a, is, is a, an academic center doing research and teaching degrees, but it's also registered as an NGO and acts as an NGO in South Africa and the continent. Takes cases to quote all of the issues, homophobia, xenophobia, discrimination against migrants, discrimination uh, uh, within the context of South Africa. So and it's, 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 it also runs five master's degrees in human rights which are pan-African in nature. So we train people for the African People's Court and Human Rights. One of the founder of this uh, center, actually, Professor Christoph Haynes, unfortunately died two weeks ago through a heart attack, but his legacy continues. He was in the Human Rights Committee. Can say last year, him and, I, us, uh, him and I launched the guidelines for use of force in uh, where there's peaceful or unpeaceful assemblies. The kind of stuff you see in the United States where police shoot at protesters or shoot at an armed man suspecting them of crime, but really rashly labeling them. So he was active in that space, but we now have an institution that is his legacy that does that. Second, South Africa is real abuse of children, including rape of children is also a, a major issue. We have the leading uh, children's rights center as well in the faculty of law. Again, it's, it's an academic institution, but again, it's an NGO. It, uh, take, it, it protects children who go to the courts and intervenes in court cases to expand the rights of children and advance, uh, and, and advance social justice. 
We also do something at the University of Pretoria, which is important for this agenda. We embed social engagement in our research and in our curricula. So 33,000 students out of the 55,000 do active research and teaching and learning embedded social engagement courses. Others do volunteerism that is engaging our communities. So we rehabilitated drug addicts, uh, isolated pieces of land, parts of the inner city. We work in semi-rural communities. During COVID, for example, we work with rural communities to assist them understand the risks and dangers of COVID-19. So, so in a sense, if you like, the university is no longer the ivory tower institution. It's a socially engaged, active citizen as an entity, but seeking to produce socially engaged citizens that are sensitive to issues beyond their own. Because people come to university, join the elite, if you like. So in order to have that antidote, so lots of our students work in Mamelodi and Lodia and Soshangube, teaching, helping kids pass the high school living exam so they can come to, to university, giving back to society, if you like. But also, it's important that we also address those issues internally. So in 2019, we passed in a comprehensive anti-discrimination act, which deals with all forms of discrimination as intersectional forms of discrimination. Very clearly laid guidelines. We've constructed an office now that deals with you know, racism, sexism, sexual harassment, homophobia, disabilism, and all of those, those kinds of issues. Because we believe that if we do not connect an anti we don't take an anti-discrimination posture and connect it with knowledge, quality education and knowledge creation, there will be that gap in society about, on the one hand, what we offer and the, the internal issues we don't address, which are also societal issues. And also, I mean, we, we also intervene in issues of hunger and related matters in communities. Our law clinic and the Center for Human Rights, you know, fights for the human rights of our communities that are abused by police brutality, police violence, injustice of the administrative system, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Yes. No, 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 no thank you very much. I, I think the role of university is to transform. Our primary role is to transform this society. Now I'll give you an example. What does it mean to transform? Uh, firstly, uh, in, in deeds, we have to, 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 to quanti qualitatively improve the lives of the people. For example, one of the things that we do at the University of Johannesburg, 80% uh, of our graduates are actually the first people in their families to graduate from university. You can imagine the multi multiplication effect of that and the transformative effect for that. All of a sudden, uh, you have a member of a, uh, of, a, of, 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 of a family and a community who can now be able to operate at the highest level coming from some of the most humble uh, parts of our country. And, and the other thing that we do, we, we looked at Soweto, it's big, it's still impoverished, uh, and we have a campus there. What do we do for them? Uh, we put one of the best primary schools, UJ Primary School, Funda Ujabune, in Soweto, so that the people in Soweto can get a world-class uh, 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 primary education. Uh, the science center that we have in Soweto, so that we can be able to uh, improve the level of scientific literacy and the level of, uh, of, 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 of scientific, scientific activities in Soweto. Uh, again, this is transformative. All our 52,000 students are actually required to spend six hours every month doing community work. And we, we, we obviously have, it can be uh, as, as, as complex as going to the local government and volunteering for six hours every, every, um, uh, uh, every month or, or going out into our streets uh, to clean and so on and so forth. Again, because what we want to do is not only to do, but to create minds that are transformative in nature that understand that when they go out there into society, they have to change society uh, for, 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 the, for the better. And then also there are elements 
that I call, you know, uh, they are not susceptible, but they are very important. Uh, in South Africa, you, you, you actually have names that are quite offensive uh, to many people. And, and the University of Johannesburg was, uh, was, was a classic example. Uh, before, uh, the first thing that we did was to rename the university. It used to be called the Rand, uh, Rand Africante University, which basically means, you know, it is an ethnic, uh, um, uh, uh, ethnic uh, it had ethnic identity, and it had, it had the identity of an ethnicity that was dominant uh, in, uh, uh, during apartheid. Our, our main library was called Hendrik Felwood, the architect of the, the architect of apartheid. So we had to go and uh, and negotiate that change because we understood that that change is necessary. Uh, but uh, but there are people who have to be carried along. They have to understand uh, that uh, we have to change uh, our identity so that our identity is positive. Now. On the issue of, uh, of, 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 of solving the, 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 the problems that confront our society, one of the things that we realized at the University of Johannesburg was that our lawmakers, very, very important people in our society, they go to our parliament, um, that is the equivalent of your congresses, uh, and they make laws and so on and so forth. And our question was, are they adequately equipped to be able to carry out their duties? Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. And we said, what do we do about it? So through our school of governance, we have a program which uh, there's an agreement between the speaker of, of, of parliament and us um, at all levels, whether it is local levels, whether it is provincial level, uh, whether it is national level, where they come and then they just learn about statecraft. How do they do what they're supposed to do, uh, which has quite significant uh, consequences well. So those are some of the things that we do. And obviously the, the, the health programs that we run in our local government, um, uh, uh, digital literacy that we did with the city of Johannesburg, because uh, people are having all these devices, but they are not literate enough. How do we bring them into the technological era? How do we make these technologies work so that they can be able to improve what they are supposed to improve uh, in order to create a better life for themselves and for their communities? Thank you. No, thank you both. And, and let me say that uh, you, in your questions, in your answers, you really did capture another question that we were gonna ask a little bit later on, but the notion of, um, our universities being an engaged university, uh, you think you're very familiar with the land, uh, land grant mission that uh, universities like mine, University of Illinois, were one of the original, uh, one of the original 34 land grant universities that were created to uh, to solve the, to serve the public good. And in each of your answers to the previous question, it's very clear to me that public engagement and to be an engaged institution, to be a resource for the common good, is that the core of what you're doing at uh, both Peoria, uh, Pretoria and uh, uh, the University of Johannesburg. And uh, you gave some good examples of what you're doing in that space. And I can tell you, most of part that I was struck by the degree to which public engagement became a dominant a uh, requirement of almost all universities, if not all universities in South Africa. So if you could just briefly just add a bit more context about, I'm glad to know of all the innovation you bring into that space, but what have been some of the greatest challenges that you've encountered along the way so that we can continue this line of conversation? And then I have one other area I certainly hope we can get in before our time is up. But what are some of the biggest obstacle to really be being engaged university? So, so if I may, so I think there will be two. One is engaging, say, industry and government. That has its own, its own sets of challenges, but I'll pack that for the time being and just go to engaging the communities. One challenge often is uh, internal, is that uh, 
what many universities consider social engagement is acts of charity. And acts of charity essentially perpetuate the same paradigm of the university as an elite institution and communities as these, you know, pitiable people that we have to do something for because they are poor, they have no housing, they don't have all of that. Whereas I think being poor and not having housing does not mean that you do not understand your own situation and you do not want to attain the means to resolve your own situation. In other words, to have your own agency to transform your lives. That is why at University of Pretoria, we anchor it in, the, in a research agenda. So any community engagement is informed by knowledge and understanding. Second, it's ethical and moral, is that you are treating the community as, if you like, co-equals as fellow human beings. Your agenda is a social justice agenda. It's not cleaning your conscience by giving the leftover foods, the clothes that you do not want, food packets and so on. You create a situation where the community can actually create, uh, 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 produce food for itself, get the skills to get employed. So you empower the community, but in a, very, in a listening ethical engagement about what they really need. But simply because a person is poor does not mean that they don't have choices and priorities about how to get out of their situation. So we do food gardens quite a lot, managed by students who often make money out of it, selling to those who can buy. But also those, those food gardens, they might work together with drug artists, people in the inner city who learn to, to plant and grow food for their own. Just as we do in the townships where students, our students help other students pass their school leaving exams so they can become university students. And as my colleagues say, once they get that degree, it's wholly transformative to themselves and their families. So for me, it's an, the, the ethics behind it are very, very important. It's actually treating our communities not as expendable people that require our charity and our pity, as full human beings whose structural circumstances and forms of discrimination have rendered unable to actually assist themselves. So, so, so breaking through that mindset among many staff and students who often are elites once they get into the university and on a road to some degree of elitism requires that you actually confront it through knowledge research and teaching and learning. So embedding it is, is fundamentally important. So the uptake can be slow, but once it gets going and people, so, so for example, we are part of the, a, a, a group of universities that uh, belong to the University Social Responsibility Network. And we hosted the, 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 the global conference this year. So never easy because also you, you, a university has to crack through its own mentality. Last with government and industry open, can be difficult because they have their own ways of working. And so again, it requires gradual engagement. It requires also that you are able to show them that engagement with you will add value to what they do, but that also they actually understand that, you know, they have to have an ethical engagement with knowledge to better do what they do. So for business not to make money by being harmful to society. So at Future Africa, for example, through that transdisciplinary lens of partnerships, we are engaging government, civil society, as well as industry in the co-creation of the questions that we should address to change society and the answers that we need that are both of fundamental knowledge, but also practically applicable. Thank you so much. No, 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 uh, uh, obviously um, uh, the pitfalls, uh, if, I, if I understand your question correctly, what are the, some of the pitfalls? I think the big pitfall is mindset change. Mm. Because South Africa does not necessarily have a, a good culture of giving. You know, we, 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 we have not uh, developed a good culture of, uh, of giving. That is why when you come to many of our universities, unlike what you would see in North America, you will, you will find very few buildings that you can associate them with uh, an individual, you know, uh, an individual who has given money. So now what is our role? I think we need to change those mindset. You know, uh, we need to, uh, to start with our own uh, students. Uh, uh, they, 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 they need to develop a culture that uh, uh, it is more than just about me, you know, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And obviously, uh, one of the things that I do, uh, in addition to uh, um, to being a vice chancellor, 
I actually am a trustee of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, uh, where uh, the culture of giving, the culture of changing the mindset of our society so that they can be able to give uh, is actually quite important. And then the second uh, uh, thing that uh, I have often uh, encountered is that um, mobilizing all the stakeholders around a particular cause to transform a society is not easy. And for example, one of the things that we have done, uh, we've just invested, uh, uh, build an innovative innovation campus uh, in Soweto uh, uh, where um, uh, students can, uh, where, where, where the community with innovative ideas can come in uh, and be able to, uh, uh, to, to see their ideas taken to fruition. Now, for us to be able to do that, we need to mobilize all aspects of our government, whether both local, national, and provincial. We have to mobilize the society itself. We also have to mobilize our industrial uh, sector. They have to come to the party. Now, uh, that, that whole that whole uh, the leadership that is that that is required uh, to be able to mobilize all those people uh, uh, sometimes uh, is not as straightforward to many of our of our people uh, uh, as as it is supposed to be. And, and finally, uh, 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 you know, is to identify those uh, projects or initiatives that will have the impact that our society need. What are some of the biggest problems that are confronting our society? For example, uh, Tawana was talking about gender-based violence. And South Africa uh, approaches gender-based violence by television ads. We are saying, what are the fundamentals that are in our society that are creating uh, a, a people who participate in gender violence and how, what do we do uh, as, 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 as leaders, uh, as a university to make sure that we can be able to uproot them and create a, a good base for society. And that is why uh, the University of Johannesburg, even though our, our mandate is to educate at the higher level, we, we take the idea of educating at the lower level very, very seriously. We have a primary school, as I've, I've already indicated. We also have a model secondary school. Uh, uh, again, uh, 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 well class, one of the biggest uh, issues that I continually have to fight is that many of our academics want to send their kids there. I said, no, that's not for you. This is for people who are below a certain threshold of any so that they can actually have good education and they can be able to go out there and transform their society. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. And it's very, very clear that you have fundamentally embraced the notion of public engagement and that you are doing everything from working both upstream and downstream of the problem. I love the idea of creating schools to address the pipeline issue. And how do you get people to really uh, understand that uh, our faculty, particularly, they understand that folks in the community is what I heard you say, Vice Chancellor. They may be poor, but they have assets, they have knowledge that needs to be taken in consideration and brought to bear on the problem. And uh, we only have about seven minutes left. And there's one more question I'd love to ask, but I can tell you this has been a rich conversation. So I thought I might defer to Ray you now to see if there's one or two questions from the audience or from those that are participating. And if not, I'll ask you for a very brief response to one last question regarding uh, uh, globalization and how do we uh, create problem solvers. Uh, Ray Tu, I'll leave it up to you. Do we uh, pose that question or do you have questions from the audience? Chancellor, if we could pose that question and invite perhaps a rather brief uh, response, just given that we do not have a whole lot of time left, that right. would be fantastic. Well, well it, it's, it's a pretty straightforward question. And since we only have a, a, about six minutes left, uh, I think all of us, I know you believe that African universities and South African universities are going to play 
a major role in uh, nation building, uh, particularly post the colonial post apartheid area. So what is, uh, give us just one example of what your universities are doing to cultivate, to grow, to perpetuate the next generations of innovators and global problem solvers. Uh, you've already talked about innovation in the public engagement space, mm -hmm. but what are you doing to grow the next generation of innovators that's going to be ready to help provide solutions to challenges in the age of digitalization? So if you could just give me one example from each of your universities that you're doing in that space, it'll be appreciated. And we got five minutes to do it. So two and a half minutes each. So if I may, so we have something called tax innovation. Tax innovation helps our students with any innovative digital ideas. They're given a space where they can work and develop the ideas with mentorship from faculty and mentorship from the alumni. They are also taught leadership skills. And then also they are linked together with their with the venture capital, as well as being taught a free online entrepreneurship course. And so we, we believe that therefore we transform them from people who are going to be looking for jobs to people who potentially can create innovative social and commercial enterprises uh, to, 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 forge, to forge forward in a digitizing world. That's a great effort. Uh, uh, that works. I know firsthand that's one of the best ways to get students to be engaged in, engage in innovation. Yes, Professor Marwan. No, 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 I, 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 obviously we have UJ in Venn, but one of the things that we did, I talked about Africa by bus. Uh, 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 in addition to that, we have uh, innovation by bus. Because so one of the things that we realize is that innovation is not something that necessarily comes while you are sitting in the lab. Yeah. You know, go out there into the community and identify the problems of the community and find solutions for them. So when we take the, those buses that are designated innovation by bus, we say, when you come back, we want you to tell us about an innovative idea that you have encountered um, out of your experience while you were, were while you are traveling across uh, Africa. And of course, uh, uh, this is based on the premise that uh, uh, um, African problems are going to be solved by Africans and they're going to be solved by Africans, but, but, but through understanding them and uh, crafting solutions to solve those problems. Thank you very much. No, thank you, gentlemen. Great answers, great conversation. And I can't wait for us to be able to continue this dialogue uh, in person, uh, either in South Africa or here in Urbana-Champaign. Uh, we are deeply humbled and gratified with your participation today. So thank you again on behalf of our entire university community. Thank you. Rayto? Well, uh, what an invigorating conversation. Uh, I can't thank you enough, Vice Chancellor Hupe um, and Marala. Uh, wonderful to have you join with us this um, afternoon on your end. Um, and uh, Chancellor Jones for facilitating this wonderful conversation. Um, if, as we prepare to close, could highlight that this is really part of our ongoing broader institutional commitment to enhancing and engaging and broadening our engagement, our strategic engagement on, um, on the African continent. And these are two um, institutions that have truly or, um, emerged as uh, partners uh, with the University of Illinois um, on the African continent and over uh, the next few months and, and years, we will continue to work very strategically and very intentionally um, in identifying mutually beneficial opportunities for engagement across our institutions. So this is really the first of many conversations and interactions that we will have, not only with our senior leadership, but with other uh, partners and constituents and stakeholders across our campuses. So this is really a to be continued. Thank you for launching us um, in this dialogue and this engagement. And we look forward to continued conversation and dialogue with other members of our respective communities. Have a good evening, have a good morning, and thank you once again.